Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here uh, today uh, to talk about integrating um, gender considerations in health research. You know, I listened to the fabulous presentations this morning. I must say I'm absolutely inspired. Uh, I'm inspired by the work that women are doing and men in the community uh, to raise issues, to actually do work that makes a difference, and um, that's just, just terrific. So give yourselves an, a round of applause. <laughs> I, I also uh, really want to uh, congratulate the organizers of this great day. Uh, I love the whole notion of the Women's Exchange. It's fabulous what you're doing, uh, reaching out to communities, inspiring people to get involved and to work with researchers. Uh, here's, here's my confession. I, I almost wonder if I have the wrong presentation today. Um, because what I'm going to talk about is really a story of activism from within a very conservative, conservative organization called the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my journey about trying to make changes within a funding agency which has a billion dollar um, budget uh, and funds health research across Canada. And we heard a few examples of some of the work that uh, has been funded by CIHR earlier today. And it's great to see um, that work also being highlighted. So um, really, this is a story of changing an institution. Um, uh, my little community-based intervention um, with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And I've been with CIHR since 2008. Uh, it is part of the federal government's um, health portfolio, receives its money from taxpayer dollars, and um, it's an interesting organization to work for. So here's the thing about research. Um, when I um, first came to CIHR, I was really startled by really a very particular viewpoint related to science and what science is. Uh, I think there's a view, for example, that excellence is easily recognizable and uniform. Peer reviewers know good science when they see it. Uh, they actually know uh, how to recognize a good study, and a good study is one that controls for all those extraneous variables and delivers a very clear outcome. Science is value free. This is a, an assumption that continues to be held onto within the, within the academy, within a number of institutions that actually don't get your messy values in the way here because if you do, it's gonna actually corrupt science in some way. Researchers need to be unencumbered by structures and complex rules. We know a good idea, we'll pursue those great ideas, just get out of our way and let us do our thing. And that you know, is, I think, a very much a viewpoint as well that we see taking place within uh, universities, or among researchers, et cetera, that they do know best and they um, will pursue the research that they're interested in. And then finally, that scientific method can control for difference in heterogeneity. By the way, happy pride to everybody. Uh, and I'm so glad to be in the province that actually really does embrace diversity. Um, it's so great to see some of the uh, activism taking place in this city. And it's really important for all of us to think about heterogeneity. So um, this is another thing that is interesting to me because I actually think difference and heterogeneity are uh, the ways in which we differ from one another is a source of interest for us, something that we need to be thinking about as we develop um, new programs and interventions. So here's the big question that I began to ask myself. How can funding structures be changed to be responsive to sex and gender considerations? How could actually CIHR as a funding agency actually take this up and begin to think about sex and gender considerations in a new way? Um, we, we did. We were very lucky to have an Institute of Gender and Health, um, but in many ways, um, I think we were seen as a fringe institute. Uh, we were seen as an institute that really was kind of the last one to be added to the 13, uh, maybe doing some interesting stuff in the area of women's health, but certainly not integral to science as a whole. So um, here's the policy frame, and this is a little bit of background for you at, um, in, in Canada. The health portfolio that's made up of the Public Health Agency of Canada, Health Canada, and um, CIHR actually has a policy on the books, which is very interesting. And it states that the policy of the government of Canada's health portfolio to use sex and gender-based analysis to develop, implement, and evaluate the health portfolio's research programs and policies. Uh, to address the different needs of men and women, boys and girls, and I would add gender diverse people. 
So here we are with this policy frame. It's sitting on the books, and the question is, this is quite typical, I'm sorry, government people, but this happens all the time. We have a policy and no teeth to the policy. How do we actually implement it and do something with it? So a policy will sit on the books like this until we actually figure out ways to actually drive it forward and do something with it. Um, but it did provide us with, a, I think, a really important frame um, to move the agenda forward. So here we are, the Institute of Gender and Health, and here's the other institutes that make up CIHR. And um, they're the usual suspects, genetics, cancer, aging, infection and immunity, musculoskeletal health, et cetera. And one of the issues that we have is that actually I believe that gender and health needs to be everywhere. Uh, this is actually, you know, you know, our work actually needs to you know, focus on key issues um, related to gender and health, but we also need to be everywhere. Uh, we need to be cross-cutting. We need to be influencing all of the other institutes. So we needed to think about how to um, make that happen. So here was our argument that we basically used. And I think it's important for us to bear in mind um, that we had to kind of start to get very clear about how we actually would convince scientists, very conservative scientists, given the assumptions um, that I've already gone over with you, um, and also um, uh, funders about how we actually might change the system. And so here's what we argued. Uh, we argued that differences matter. Heterogeneity isn't just to be controlled for. Difference matters. And we need to understand variation, and we need to understand how to embrace a variety of people in the research enterprise. Uh, the other um, argument that we made is that this is about better science. We didn't argue that this is on ideological grounds. Uh, we could have done that. We decided, no, this is actually just about good science. Um, like, to not pay attention to sex and gender is just bad science. And I'm going to really today talk about some very compelling arguments that we used, many of these examples out of Ontario research to make that case. And then finally, this was the winner for researchers, is that actually considering sex and gender is a source of innovation. You actually can make new discoveries. You can learn about things anew. You can think through problems in a new way uh, if you start to think about sex and gender. So uh, that's been our argument, and I'm sticking to it. It's worked uh, so far. And I'm going over this today because I think it's also important for all of you to be thinking about the arguments for why sex and gender matter, why it's important for the Ontario Ministry of Health to be asking about a gender lens. So here's the world of sex and gender. I've already alluded to this. It actually crosses all areas. We consider ourselves really multifocal from everything from epigenetics to circulatory health to cancer research to addiction. I cannot think of a single area of health research where we shouldn't be thinking about sex and gender. Now, one of the things you might be wondering about is what, uh, what I mean by sex and gender. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. We actually do make a distinction between the terms sex and gender, and we use sex to refer to the biological, the ways in which our bodies are different. And so we can think about our bodies. These are actually chemical formulations for our hormones. Um, our brains are different. Male and female brains are different. Um, you know, um, when you think about even, you know, our cells are different. Every cell in our body is sexed. So that means that the way you respond to drugs is going to be different if you're male or female. Um, your chemical composition does influence the way you will respond to treatments. Your vessel size, your body size, all of these factors make up your sex and really do make a difference. Sex is not a single thing. It's made up of a number of biological attributes. Uh, the other notion we use is gender, and gender is really a socially constructed um, notion of our roles, how we dress, how we posture, how we, how we enact our gender roles. Um, uh, is, is one way that we can think about what gender is. And, you know, so gender, again, is not a single thing. It's about the food we drink. It's about our risks that we take. It's about our interactions. Men and women interact in very different ways. It's about our roles that we take on. It's about power. Uh, it's about what we wear and how we choose to wear it. All of those things, in so many ways, affect our health outcomes. Our social world, you know, gets under our skin and affects us biologically. And who we are biologically affects us socially. So from a research standpoint, it's important to think about sex and gender in very, uh, to pull them apart, even though we can't in our daily lives pull them apart. From a research standpoint, it, it's helpful to do so. 
Now I'm going to begin with uh, uh, just insert another apology, and that is I always continue to return to the binary of male, female, men, and women, and I apologize for that. I can't get those pronouns out of my head. And yet we also know that there, and we heard today about gender diversity and how important that is for us to be thinking about, and to also challenge the binary, um, to be challenging the way we think about what these notions are. So um, I would argue that neither uh, sex nor gender are, impart, are important, and this has been a, a part of our, our argument, that neither um, um, are, are sufficient. We need both of these, and how they actually combine to influence the health of men and women. So I'm going to give you a few examples uh, just to kind of get you thinking about this issue. And this is about, these are examples that I've used to make the case. This is a, um, data from British Columbia, and it's on chlamydia infection rates. Now, we could take a look at this slide, and we could initially say, so what we see here are the rates, and this is 15 to 19-year-olds, 20 to 24-year-olds. They are in deep trouble here. Look at these rates. So, um, but in red is the female, and blue is the, is the male. So initially, many of us would look at this and say, oh, those women have very high chlamydia rates. What is going on there? We've got a big, big problem here. We better start developing intervention programs for young women because they've got very high chlamydia rates. So, you know, and indeed that is the case. That's something that we should be concerned about. But another way to think about this, where are the boys? Where are the boys here in this slide? Because the fact of the matter is, is that if the girls have that high chlamydia rates, the boys likely do too, but they're not part of this picture. And so that's actually applying a gender lens to a set of data. It's actually in, it really interrogating the data and thinking about it in a new way, thinking about what's unintended and not being done in this work and what else needs to be done. And it also brings out that point that Paula made earlier today, and, um, and that is that we often need to think about boys and men's health if we're going to improve the health of women and girls as well. And so this actually, this question about what's happened to the boys led to a colleague of mine's research uh, focused on STI testing and uh, young boys. And she wrote this great paper that I love called Not the Swab, uh, Young Men's Experiences with STI Testing. And again, it's a small study, qualitative study involving interviews with men aged 15 to 25. And what she learned was that dominant ideals of masculinity were affecting these young men's um, help seeking. There was a gendered nature of the clinical interaction. They weren't sure what was going to be worse if they were actually going to um, become aroused uh, with a female clinician or become aroused when they had a male cl clinician. Think about those gendered dynamics and how they would play out in the clinical setting for a young man. And it, well, actually, really importantly, they were very concerned with the swab because they wrongfully believed that the swab was still being used for STI testing in the province of British Columbia, and it is not. So uh, actually, um, this research, small in scale, really led to radical policy change. And indeed, we now have online testing for young, uh, for young men and women in British Columbia, where they can actually phone in, indicate that they need to be tested, get um, sent a uh, uh, testing requisition over um, the internet, and take that and bring in their urine sample, et cetera, or do a self-swab. So you know that's removing barriers based on a gender analysis. That's changing the system. So that's one example. I'm going to give you a few more. Um, there are a number of gender biases in our measures, and these are other things that we need to be thinking about as researchers, but also as clinicians. And I'm going to give you a few examples. Commonly used measures of depression have been demonstrated to be biased. So um, these, bi these examples of bias are bias that actually, uh, I think, tend to over-report depression in women and under-report depression in men. The CESD is a commonly used measure, and it's got two items that are highly biased. And these are the items. They ask people to rate how much, whether in the last week, they are cry having crying spells. Crying is gendered. We learn to cry. Uh, you know, we learn as young women it's okay for us to cry. We learn that it is not really an ideal masculine trait to cry. So when someone basically says, asks about crying spells, men are going to say more, more often going to say no to that, and women more often yes. The other is talk less. Pro-social skills are highly gendered. We learn to be more social as young girls. We're accepted to become social. And those, that really is gendered, the gendered nature of our talk. Uh, and that, again, is going to influence these outcomes. This is not biological. This is what, as a society, we're taught to do. 
So we have to begin to go back to all these measures we're using in our science as well and think about, boy, maybe I need to rethink this a little bit. Uh, it's also the way that clinicians recognize and diagnose depression, and it is biased. We know that women are tended to uh, be diagnosed with depression more often than men are, and it's because it's considered really a feminized condition. And there's a lot of history behind that, um, and I won't go into that today because I don't have a lot of time for that. And so we need to think about both our health systems, we need to think about our diagnostic criteria, we need to think about you know, how we're measuring some of these things in terms of gender bias. And that's why we need to integrate sex and gender into our health research. And so here we're coming to pharmaceuticals, and again, I could give you a number of examples. Uh, here's, the, here's the crazy thing about Health Canada. We, f we finally have a half-decent policy on the inclusion of women in clinical trials. Uh, that Finally, some people begin to think that we should actually maybe include women in trials on drugs. Uh, but the problem is, is that we include women on trials and drugs, but we don't actually look to see if there's differential effects for men and women. We assume uh, that if they're included in the study, then we're going to be able to actually look at those outcomes. But we don't actually look at really saying, well, does this particular drug have a different outcome for a male and for a female? I'm talking about biological interactions here, phys physical interactions. And so because it has tended to be the case that more men um, are included in trials than women, um, men tend to be covered off a little bit better in terms of, um, in in terms of prescription drugs. Um, but we also know that in terms of our prescribing practices that women and men receive different drugs. That's also a fascinating area for us to pay attention to. So we know that whether a man or a woman presents with a, uh, uh, with a complaint influences the clinical encounter. So what complaint you present with, what you say uh, about that complaint is going to influence what happens in that clinical encounter. Um, and, and it's something, the gendered practice of the clinical encounter has not been something we've thought about a lot. A number of studies have suggested that women are more likely to be, be prescribed benzodiazepines than men, and this is a long history of women and benzodiazepines. We all know that history. Here, honey, here's a valley in prescription for you. Um, it has changed. It has shifted. But we are still seeing those biases, those unintended biases taking place in the clinical encounter. And again, that's why we have to pay uh, attention to this. Uh, men, on the other hand, are less likely to be prescribed analgesia. And you can understand that kind of gendered um, notion about men being strong, manly, not needing drugs uh, to manage their pain, et cetera, toughing it out. These are hegemonic notions of masculinity that pervade our society and influence our health opportunities and our health outcomes. So I'm not going to talk too much. The drug companies understand this, and they know how to repackage their drugs to um, actually meet the needs of men and women in different ways. But researchers haven't thought about that. So here I'm going to give you a few examples of gender in the health system. I apologize, these examples are a bit older, um, but I have found them very effective in terms of making the case about why we need to think about um, health outcomes. And this is a study done in Ontario by Fowler. It was reported in 2007. There have been other studies since this time that also are helping to really make the case about bias in our health system. And so this is a cohort study of over 400,000 people. They actually used data, data, existing data to look at uh, patients in Ontario. And they adjusted for illness severity. So people, they looked at people coming into the hospital, and they actually said, well, let's control for severity of illness, because that obviously is going to affect what kind of treatment they're going to get. And so what they found is that after uh, illness severity, uh, adjusting for that, that fewer women were admitted to ICUs than men, 39.9% compared to 60%. And this was particularly true for older women, that older women are less likely to receive mechanical ventilation or pulmonary artery catheterization than men, and that older women also had a slightly higher risk of death in ICU. So you might say, wow, that's quite frightening, and I agree it is. Um, and it's not as if physicians are basically saying when someone comes into the emergency room, oh, you're a woman, you don't get to get treated. This is about unintended bias in our system. I think that we don't always understand the ways in which bias plays out in terms of our clinical encounters. And that's why we have to study sex and gender and health outcomes. Uh, because if we didn't think about this, we would not begin to understand what we would need to do to change our health system. So it's very, very important. You know, you can think about uh, institutional gender bias in a number of ways. 
Uh, the, the great example is how girls were taught that they were not good at mathematics. And we learned that girls are just fine at mathematics. It was actually the school system that were actually the teachers in very subtle ways were teaching girls that they weren't good at math. They weren't spending time with them at, with math. And as soon as we corrected our system, girls all of a sudden were starting to thrive at mathematics. The same is going to be true here. And the same is true that once we understand these biases, we can start to change the system. We can start to actually correct. But if we don't study it, we're not going to be able to figure it out. This is one of my favorite studies um, done, and it's work by Corey Borkoff. Uh, I actually think she was a PhD student when she was doing this work, and so let me explain it to you, what she did. So she looked at patients um, and their sex on physicians' recommendation for total knee arthroplasty. So she took 71 physicians, 38 family physicians and 33 orthopedic surgeons in Ontario, and um, she blinded them to assessments of two standardized patients, a man and a woman. So these are patients who were taught to present in very particular ways as they came into the clinical encounter, to say certain things about um, the symptoms that they were experiencing, to present in very particular ways. A man and a woman, they were saying the exact same things. Got it so far? So what they found, basically, and here's the catch, is that the odds of an orthopedic surgeon recommending total knee arthroplasty to a male patient was 22 times greater. Uh, here's the confidence intervals, and they're actually, um, they're actually quite wide, and this is because it's a pretty small sample. Um, then for a female patient, and the odds of a family physician recommending total knee arthroplasty to a male patient was two times uh, greater um, than for a female patient, greater for a male patient. So again, bias. And, you know, I think we deserve better in terms of our health system. And I think that we need to be asking questions about that. That's why I love the strategy for patient-oriented research. That's why I think it is so important to be including measures of sex and gender in that research. Uh, because if we don't, it's so easy for these things to pass us by and for us to assume that the status quo is good enough. So, um, I do think that we need to shape science. Um, gender and sex um, uh, does also, um, one of the other arguments that we've used is that it is also a source of innovation. You can learn all sorts of cool new things if you actually start to pay attention to gender and sex. And, um, you know, I think that is starting to take off a little bit, and I'm going to give you a few examples uh, in relation to that. So here's Catherine Sandberg, and I know most of you are doing more community-based research, but this also applies to people who are studying cells, tissues, and animals as well. Um, that so often when we study cells, tissues, and animals, they're only studying male cells, tissues, and animals because female animals have pesky hormones that get in the way of your, out, your study outcomes. And so, uh, so we see biases from the very beginning. And so here's an example. Uh, that Catherine Sandberg, uh, from the director for the Center of Studies, Sex Difference in Health and Aging and Disease, um, uh, this is a statement she made. The path to a new drug starts with the basic science. You study an animal model of the disease, and that's where you discover a drug target, but 90% of researchers are still studying a male animal models of the disease. So your drug target from the very beginning can be biased because it's based on an, a male model. And, you know, again, we can do better because um, so often it's so expensive for a drug to be taken to market and then find out after the fact that it's actually causing deleterious harms uh, for women. Um, but that's exactly what has happened. Recently, the FDA removed the drug or actually changed dosing for the drug, Zipolidin, because of this very problem that they didn't study the differences of that drug in terms of outcomes for males and females. So we, again, need to do better. So here's another study about the need to do better, and this is from the HIV AIDS field. This is HIV prevalence among uh, young people in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I'm giving you this example because I think, again, it points to some of the, uh, I think, the gaps in our system. And here we're seeing in wi women are in the red and men are in the black, and so this is, and this is HIV prevalence. And it's, it's just, you know, it's pretty self-evident that we're start, we are seeing, um, in terms of the disease, in, a number, in every one of these countries, that women are being differentially affected um, by the virus. And that's for a variety of uh, biological reasons, in terms of their susceptibility. But now let's look at um, the development and testing of um, antiretroviral anti -viral therapies. Here's the inclusion of men and women in ARV testing at the present time. 
And so we see actually the exact opposite taking place. Um, we see that the percent of female and ma male participants in every clinical trials, here are the women and here are the men. Again, we need to do better. And it's not until we start to create, again, those nasty policies that are going to require uh, that researchers actually think about these issues that we're going to get anywhere. I'm going to try and wrap up because I want time for questions, and so here we go. So research must systematically incorporate attention to sex and gender in design, analysis, and interpretation of findings. The World Health Organization said it a number of years ago, but we're still not doing it to the degree that we should be. Uh, here's Jane Danska from the University of Toronto, and here, she's a basic scientist. I like to use this example, not for this crowd, but for the... Uh, the, those who are doing genetic studies, they actually know her name, they think she's a fabulous researcher, and it does tend to impress them, so I'm going to try and impress you with this example. Uh, but Jane actually happened to include female animals in her study, and this is what she learned. I actually first heard about her on the very famous science program called Quirks and Quarks on CBC, a source of all great information. And, uh, but I heard her talking about her, this study, and I thought, wow, i got to learn more about this. And this, oops, this is what she found, uh, that when we were surprised to see that when young uh, female mice received normal gut microbes from adult males, their testosterone levels rose. We then showed that this hormone was essential for gut microbe treatment to protect against the disease. This was diabetes. It was completely unexpected to find that the sex of an animal determines aspects of their gut microbe composition. This is leading to new breakthroughs in understandings of diabetes and the role of testosterone in the development of inflammation. Now, if they hadn't done it, they wouldn't have learned about this. This is innovation. This is new discovery. And that actually does you know, create a lot of you know, really good motivation for scientists. So that's why we need to do it as well. OK, so this is what we're doing at CIHR. Uh, you have to change the structures uh, if you're going to actually change the system. And so we now are making people fill out questions in a very, uh, very, very um, obvious way. And so anyone who applies to CIHR, no matter what you study, if you study cells and can you know, cancer cells, or if you're studying population public health interventions, STI, sex trade work, whatever you're studying, you have to now answer two questions. And you could consider this consciousness raising. You could consider this um, you know, some kind of bureaucratic intervention. But it is shaping science and changing the way we're doing our work. And so here are the questions, very simple. Are sex biological cons considerations taken into account in this study? And are gender considerations taken into account in this study? And then please explain. Now, I have to tell you that we spend a lot of time at the Institute of Gender and Health tracking this information and studying people's answers. And at least now we have a, a, uh, we have a baseline. At least we now know where we have to focus on and uh, what areas of science we need to continue to push forward on. So here's what's happening. It's good news. In terms of um, who's responding to these questions, since 2011, when we first started, it was just only 15% um, percent, um, and 20% who are actually thinking about relevance to sex or relevance to gender. And we've seen a, a really good increase over time that actually scientists are now saying, yes, indeed, I am thinking about sex or I'm thinking about gender in relation to my science. How well they're doing might be another matter, we still know that there is work to be done. Uh, this is trends by pillar, and this is, shows us where pillar is the area. So it's kind of a term that we use at CIHR, and I'll just briefly explain that this is biomedical, and this is where we have the most work to do. So these are people who are really doing very basic science. These are the people doing the animal studies, the cells, the tissue studies, and they still are not paying great attention to this. We've got a lot more work to be done there. Uh, what's interesting is we see uh, people in population health, they're really taking this up and thinking about it in new ways. And the most growth has been in the health system. Look at that increase from just under 30% to up to 60%. So that's a success story. Making the argument, explaining it, making structural change, you know, trying to move a system forward. So I think our world in 2014 is a better world. I think things are changing. I'm an optimist. Optimists live longer, they say. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of things happening. And I'll just tell you a few of them. 
um, in terms of, we, we now are seeing all sorts of changes. We saw the Chief um, Medical Health Officer's report of Canada focus on gender in 2012. That was the report uh, from David Butler-Jones on the state of the nation, focused on gender. Uh, we, this is a, a report out of British Columbia. It's about men in health, and people say, well, they do make the argument, and I agree, they'll say, what about the men, what about the men? But actually, men's health will be good for women's health, too, because at least they're starting to pay attention to gendered issues. And so we need to also support our colleagues doing that work and think about that. Um, we're seeing all sorts of changes. Health technology assessment, um, the Canadian Agency for Drugs, Technology and Health is now uh, beginning to take up questions related to se sex and gender and drugs and technology. Uh, the World Health Organization is changing. We're seeing clinical practices change. We're seeing journals change. The Journal for the International AIDS Society now has a policy that you have to break down your data by, by sex and or gender uh, in your, in your, um, when you report on your findings. Uh, and until editorial policies change, again, the whole research pipeline uh, needs to be modified to really make a difference so we can actually get those results. And uh, you know, we're studying those little microbes um, that Jane Danska talked about, and I think that's pretty neat as well. So I do think there's a climate of change and opportunity. You are doing great work that's part of a bigger movement, and the bigger movement is really thinking about sex, gender, and health outcomes. You're doing work, I think, the most important work, because you're on the ground, working with communities, thinking about these issues. Um, and I really do commend you for that. Um, I always say we are all the Institute of Gender and Health trying to move this great agenda forward, trying to think about the ways in which we can shape science. And I encourage you, who, you know, when you listen to uh, science on the radio or hear people talk about science or the importance of science, that you ask the question as well, what about sex, what about gender, could the study have been better, could I make this work better? Uh, and we always like to end uh, by asking people to envision a world where sex and gender are integrated as key considerations in health research and its applications. Just imagine what we could learn. Just imagine all the areas of science where we haven't thought about these issues. And if we started to think about it, just imagine the things that we could actually achieve in terms of improving the health of Canadians and the health of people globally. So have you considered the possibilities? They are endless. Thank you very, very much. So thank you very much. What a talk. That was <laughs> fabulous. Thank you so much. So we have time for a few questions. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer any questions about CIHR or other things as well. So yeah. Hi, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Shilpa Dogra from the University of Ontario. My question is about that, that research net box that shows up. Um, my research is in exercise science and I do physical activity epidemiology. And typically my research, I guess, involves sex and gender. And so when I come to that box in, in research net, I have no idea what to write because I always do the analysis, you know, by males and females stats wise, but I'm always stuck at what I can write in there that, that shows that I really am considering sex and gender. Thank you for that question. And we know you're all struggling and I'm happy you're struggling. It makes me happy. At least you're thinking about it. Uh, uh, there's two things I'll say to that. One is, um, in terms, so those are the tick boxes that we're getting people to complete. Uh, we are now developing training materials for researchers and for peer reviewers to help them understand what might be required in terms of a gender or sex analysis in research. And I actually, there are two things I'd say. You know, I made this big distinction between sex and gender, and in some cases, particularly in demographic cases, we cannot pull those things apart. And the question I would ask is, is this biological or social? And exercise is a very interesting example. It's probably a little bit of both. And even to begin to hypothesize about um, what's really happening, or to say these are areas in which I might be able to probe and think about response to exercise, uh, I think would be really interesting. Like, just consider the possibilities about what might be happening in terms, I don't know your particular area, but in terms of exercise prescriptions, adherence, um, bone density, I mean, I, hormones and bone, I mean, I could go on and on. If you start to really think about it, there's so many areas, and you might not be able to study it all, but think about how you might embed that in your work. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for all that you've done for the CIHR Institute of Gender and Sex. Um, just to build, to build on, my name's Nazila Kanlu, and I'm from York University. To build on the last comment, um, there's right now quite a range in how thoughtfully people respond to that uh, question, uh, sex and gender. And I don't get a sense that yet it's tied to the scientific merits of applications that do get funded versus the, those are that are in the middle and those that are on the bottom of a pile. But it sounds like there are some measures or metrics that are thought out to, that might in time be instituted to further push the uh, sex and gender integration into um, whether a project is deemed to be you know, of high scientific value or not. Yeah, so thanks for that. So that's true. Uh, we could not convince that it should be actually a criteria for whether you get funded or not. The good news is, is that we're changing the system at CIHR. When systems change, you can again start to change policies. So I actually think that we will now, with the new, with the new system at CIHR, start to see key criteria that reviewers must respond to vis-a-vis -vis sex and gender. And that'll be huge for us, because right now, um, they, people complete the questions, um, but in a review panel, the geneticists in particular, they're the worst, I have to say. Uh, the geneticists, they get together, and they don't even look at those boxes. They don't care about them. Um, so we want to make them care about them. And so the way to do that, and with the system changing at CIHR, uh, they're now going to, it's going to be a structured peer review, so you actually have to, the reviewers are going to have to respond to particular questions, and we've been told that there will be questions related to sex and gender there. So that'll help to kind of motivate people even further. And there will be areas of science where sex and gender are not relevant, but at least justify it then, at least indicate that you've thought about it. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I was just wondering how far is the sex and gender from evidence-based medicine? And uh, like uh, we can recognize every day study being considered as evidence-based medicine and taken with, uh, to, to be considered in clinical practice while it is not actually uh, addressing the sex and gender related factors. So Yeah, so that's partly the whole research pipeline um, in that if it's not published, if we don't have the evidence, it can't inform evidence-based practice. And so we've got to modify the whole pipeline. Uh, we're working with a Cochrane uh, collaboration who develop um, syntheses of research to inform clinical practice. And um, they struggle all the time because researchers don't even report that in their scientific findings. So then practice guidelines come out about how to treat hypertension, and we don't have any evidence related to specifically males and females and differential kind of clinical practices in all cases. In some cases, we do. So there is more work to be done, and so that's why we got to... Eventually, I think it'll start to move downstream, and we'll start to see improvements in clinical practice as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually personalized medicine. It's kind of the first stratification. Let's, you know, let's start and get that right, as far as I'm concerned. So thank you very much. Good.